everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Appraisal Buzzcast. We have a great episode for you today. With me, as always, is our host, Hal Humphreys. Hey, Hal, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jim. How are you today? I'm doing great. Well, we are going to be talking about foreclosure work, and we uh, we have our guest with us is Pam Teal from Teal Consulting Services, and we're talking about her course on foreclosures. Pam, it is so good to have you join us today. Um, I always love seeing your face and getting to spend time with you. Um, for the folks listening that don't know who Pam Teal is, tell us a little bit about your history in this business of real estate appraisal. All right. Well, I've been doing it for a hot minute. <laughs> I started appraising in the early 90s in South Texas um, along the Texas Gulf Coast. So, you know, if you can do the math, you can see I've gone through a number of changes over the years, but started there doing commercial as well as some residential work and then went to work for a lender uh, and started that business for a while. And then I finally, as I like to say, grew up to be what I really wanted to be. I'm an instructor. I get to write some courses and work with some of you fine folks in doing that. Mentorship and consulting, those are the things that I really find enjoyment in. I love it. Well, thank you, Pam, for taking the time to be with us today. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take a real quick break and go hear from one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back. LIA Administrators and Insurance Services, serving valuation professionals since 1978. We provide e &O insurance with a commitment to superior customer service, outstanding liability education, and unmatched claim defense, benefiting over 10,000 real estate professionals nationwide. Explore our exclusive appraiser liability education by Peter Christensen and cost-effective seminars designed to foster your growth. Our underwriters, with an average of 26 years of experience each, are dedicated to supporting appraisers. Visit liability.com to discover how LIA can safeguard your business. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Appraisal Buzz. I'm Hal Humphreys. I've got Pam Teal from Teal Consulting Services with me today. Pam, again, thank you for being here. You know, mm -hmm. so far, there haven't been just a whole slew of foreclosures because the market hasn't been, it's been pretty hot for quite some time. But I have a sense, a sneaking suspicion that as we start to see prices come down, um, as we start to see marketing times extend, um, do you have a little crystal ball that says we might start to see an uptick in foreclosures? Well, it's up there on the back of my shelf. I keep one up there just in case I need it. Um, it looks a little cloudy at the moment, but <laughs> it's really, really hard to determine that. I really personally, and you know, I'm probably going to show my a little bit of my ignorance here. I really thought we would have seen it by now. Um, I know there was that whole period post for for a uh, post COVID, sorry, where we um, expected that um, things would start heating up and we would start seeing some of that. But we had so much forbearance going on and that went on for a long period of time. But now that those days are kind of over, I keep thinking things are going to settle and we're going to start seeing some of that and particularly interest rates being as high as they are sometimes if a person is kind of behind on things they might can refinance and kind of catch up and that's not going to happen with interest rates like they are so well and a lot of people you know if they if they bought during the covid kind of boom time they had such a low interest rate um that if they were to refinance today their payment would be much higher than it is sure. based on the old interest rate um absolutely in, in a time like this, when, when you know, I, I think most people that pay attention to the market are expecting um, some degree of foreclosures coming in, in the not too distant future. Would you suggest that appraisers start thinking about, you know, can they handle pre foreclosure short sales and REO type work? I think that's a very smart thing to do. You know, um, with everything that's going on in the appraisal industry right now, we keep talking about how we as appraisers can add value to the game. And I think this is one. Um, if you are ready to handle with confidence uh, pre foreclosures or and foreclosures, REO properties, if you will, then I think you're going to be ahead of the game. You know, we've talked about diversifying your practice. And I think this is one of the ways that you can do that and be prepared uh, for when those things come. 
and make it known, um, you know, that you have become the expert in the field, if you will, when it comes to uh, doing foreclosure work, because it is a different animal. It's not the same. Right. And, and talk to me just briefly, how is foreclosure work different from lending work? Well, you're looking at um, different different types of things. Obviously, if we're doing if we're talking a pre foreclosure, then we're trying to the bank's trying to figure out usually, or the lender is trying to fin- figure out what they can get for that property, what it's really worth, and how that stacks up against what they've got it in their portfolio as. Uh, what kind of loss or what kind of gain will there be from that? And then you've got things like, you know, short sales, which are a totally different animal. We've got to sell it within a certain period of time. Again, uh, there's a time factor that we don't take into consideration when we're talking market value. With market value, we're looking at how long does it need to be exposed on the market to be able to achieve this particular market value. In short sales and REO properties, you're typically not looking at that. And there's a shorter time frame. You'll hear terms like liquidation appraisals and that kind of thing. There's lots of different nomenclature that go into it, but primarily we're looking at something that's going to be more of a forced sale, if you will. And that, that, that time that we have to sell that property will be less perhaps than what's going on in market. And, and it depends obviously in the market that you're in. I'm in Austin. And I think we made like number one on the list of we're going to continue to appreciate and value around here. Uh, so depending on the market you're in, it will be a different impact. So you can't just take a nationwide look at it either. It's got right. to you got to focus on particularly where you right. are. And it's, it, it is very specific to different smaller market areas, um, you know, depending on, on what's going on in that market, like Nashville, like Austin is, is still seeing increasing prices. We are seeing a longer time on market uh, for mm-hmm. properties. Mm-hmm. And, and, and look, here's the thing, you know, I, I saw an engagement with some appraisers on Facebook the other day. Someone was talking about, um, you know, you do a foreclosure appraisal and, you know, somebody appraised it a year and a half ago during the middle of the COVID boom and said it was worth a million two. I'm doing this appraisal today. It's only worth 700,000 or whatever the number is. It's like, how did that appraiser back then get it so wrong? They may not have gotten it wrong. Things have changed. Mm -hmm. That's Um, true. So what are some things that appraisers can do aside from taking your course on uh, foreclosure appraisals. What are some things that appraisers can do to get themselves ready to take on this kind of work? Well, I think the first thing you've got to remember is it, any appraisal problem is always identification of the problem. That's the first step. Anytime we're doing an appraisal, we've got to identify the problem. Part of that is who is your intended user, your client and your intended user. So, go to those websites and look up the information that the GSEs or whomever might have the FHA handbook on foreclosure, how they deal with it in-house and how they expect appraisers to deal with it. So become familiar with those types of things. I think it's extremely important to start with. Get familiar Um, with what the clients expect to see. Exactly. Exactly. is the analysis process different for a foreclosure appraisal from what you would normally see in a standard lending appraisal? I think many times it's got it to be a little more in depth because you are looking at, and, and here's a misconception, by the way, a lot of appraisers will think, all right, if I, if I'm appraising a foreclosure property, I'm only going to compare it with foreclosure properties. That's not true. The lender is really wanting to know most of the time you have to ask (laughs) what is the value? What is the market value? That's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for a distressed sale value. Uh, Problem identification would tell you, all right, they're looking for market value. If the vast majority of the sales in that particular neighborhood are not, REO properties, then you're probably not going to be comparing your subject to an REO. Right. uh, So, 
Now, th there was a time in the in the early '90s when almost all the sales you had were distressed sales, and that was the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've we've you and I've been at this a hot minute, so we've seen this a time or two when that's well, what you got. <laughs> settle down, there, Pam. We're both youngsters. We just got started just the other day. Um, let's let's do this. I want to take a real quick break here from one of our sponsors, and we'll come right back. Yes, sir. Did you know that NAN hosts quarterly discussions with our appraisal panel on bias, inclusion, equity, and diversity initiatives that impact the appraisal industry? The topic of bias in the appraisal world will remain at the forefront of legislative, agency, and lender priorities well into the future. At NAN, we believe that intentional bias is only a very small fraction of the underlying issue, and that outdated policies and regulations and unconscious bias are of far greater concern. It's our hope to work closely with the appraiser community as partners in an endeavor to improve processes and procedures and ensure equitable treatment for all valuations. Learn more by visiting nan-amc.com. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Hal Humphreys. I'm joined today by Pam Teal, and we're um, talking about foreclosure appraisals. You know, Pam, it occurs to me in this kind of appraisal work, there may be um, some extraordinary assumptions, uh, more so than a normal appraisal work. Um, mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples of how to handle these correctly? The one that automatically came to mind, Hal, uh, as you were talking, was sometimes you're asked to actually come up with two values, an as-is value. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes REO properties are not in the best of condition when they are vacated. Um, people are not necessarily happy. And, and I've seen instances where they've taken uh, appliances, toilets, sinks, <laughs> you name it. So the property may not be in the best of condition, but you're being asked to do an as is, as well as an as repaired value. And so that in itself, uh, you have to know how, how are you going to come up with those particular uh, dollar amounts. You have to come into something that's going to tell you that. So I'm going to advocate for, uh, I've heard Tim Anderson say it a lot, the cost approach really does have value when you're doing an appraisal that will help you with some of determining what some of those uh, repair costs might be. And then obviously exposure time on the market. It's going to be extremely important that you understand what exposure time is and the impact that it can have on that opinion of value. And I think it's important to point out at this point, you know, exposure time. Um, this is one of those things like going forward, um, appraisers need to start thinking about what is their superpower. And I think the thing that makes us relevant going forward is our ability to analyze things. In reports like this, exposure period is not going to be a quick list item. That's true. It's going to, it's going to be something you have to analyze and put some thought into and have some proof for. Um, and and it's, it's right there in the market for you to, to claw it out. But it's not just as simple as making a quick list, you know, you can punch in exposure period, you know, marketing time, those things, they're not foregone conclusions when you're dealing with this kind of property. Well, and re really with any kind of property, Hal, because I remember um, the, the example that I use a lot in teaching is I was in Ingleside on the Bay when they announced the, uh, the BRAC uh, closures for the Naval Air Station Ingleside. And that's a small community that was its primary employer. That thing was closing. You could hear the air being sucked out of that place. So I'm standing you, you there. Hear the, you could hear the exposure period of the marketing time expand while you're standing <laughs> exactly. there. Exactly. Exactly. And so I'm writing this report thinking, okay, I've got good historic data. It doesn't tell me a thing about what's going to happen tomorrow. Because you know the people in the military are going to try to get their house on the market first and get it sold. And things are going to start stagnating. Things are going to start selling at below market values. I mean, it was going to tank. It was going to tank. So that's the way I like to think of it when I'm thinking about exposure time versus uh, marketing time. Two different things. And we confuse it by saying marketing time 
and trying to mix it with what our real estate partners uh, use that same terminology because they're talking about something different than we are. And we need to realize that. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned the state of houses when they've been uh, in foreclosure. A lot of times in my experience back in the early nineties, when, when I was helping my dad out, um, on foreclosure properties, we were explicitly told, do not approach the front of the house. Do not try to get inside the house. You know, it's a contentious relationship, you know, safety is first. But I remember, you know, way back in the day, I looked at a piece of property in Ashland city, Tennessee, that had been foreclosed on. And it was in the REO portfolio of a bank. Um, they had recently gotten title to it, but they hadn't done anything to it. They hadn't actually been in it. The, the, the occupant was gone. It was in the bank's possession. They asked me to go do an inspection. I walked in and there was, there was a particular funk that hit my nostrils when I walked in the door and I thought, huh, that, that's, that doesn't, that doesn't bode well. Uh, and as I'm going through the house, um, obviously the water had been cut off uh, apparently some time ago. So the toilet had been filled to overflowing mm -hmm. and then they just switched over to the bathtub and filled that to overflowing. <laughs> and it's like, you know, the, the as is value for a property like that takes a certain kind of buyer to get their head around what it's going to take to clean that up. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, look, this is, I think foreclosure work is an interesting part of the work we do as appraisers. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I find that historically speaking in, in the early nineties and then 2008, nine, 10, as we were looking at um, a bunch of foreclosures in that time frame, the interesting thing is the banks that were asking people to do those kind of appraisals, they really wanted to know what the answer was. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. There's no prettying it up. You know, maybe I don't need to call that out or maybe I just ignore. No, you don't don't pretty that up. But as you were talking, how there was one thing that I was reminded of, too. We have to be careful of a bias. When we say foreclosure property, that does not necessarily mean a property that has been damaged in some right. way. I bought a foreclosure property. The bank had had it for a period of time. They'd gone in and done all the remodel, put in new flooring. I mean, the, it was great. And I got a great deal on it because they were yeah. wanting it off their books. Uh, yeah, so you know, be careful of the bias of that. And that's, that's, that's interesting because as these commercials play, as our sponsor commercials play, a lot of times I'm listening to them as we're sitting here uh, waiting for them to finish. And I'm thinking about, you know, LIA's um, thing with Peter Christensen talking about bias and then NAN talking about bias. You know, we, there's a lot of talk about bias in the appraisal industry these days. Um, but there's, there's more than one kind of bias and you're absolutely right. Look, it's never the real estate's fault. Right. Right. Um, it's not. And, and a lot and of times it's not even the fault of the people that, that are being foreclosed upon. Maybe things are outside of their, you know, their control. But, you know, a lot of times these foreclosure properties, they are in fine condition or they can be repaired. And then the right. bank is left with an asset that they then need to sell to get it off their books. Um, exactly. And they need to know from a thoughtful caring analytical appraiser they need to know what that asset is worth so they mm -hmm. they get what they need out of it and and i think what appraisers don't know don't know too is that a lot of times particularly if you're dealing with a large lender or bank um, the person who's looking at that appraisal is going to be different than the one that's been looking at yours for the purchases these are people who are coming in from the back side and they're trying to figure out, all right, we've got an asset here all of a sudden that we've acquired. Uh, what are we going to do with it? Number one. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a, the debt that's still owed on it. They've sold it in the secondary market, for example. They're going to get it back. Now, what are we going to do with it? So there's a lot that's going into it in a different way than what we do on a purchase transaction. 
yeah. for example. And you reminded me too. Uh, one of the things that I do touch on in the in the course is is about safety. Um, if you are in a situation where you know you're going into, and I I did it one time. You kind of mentioned yours, where you're going into a house that this one had not been secured since it had been foreclosed on, and so guess what? People had been in and out of it and living in it, um, and. As I opened the front door, I realized I do not need to be here by myself. And I slowly backed out, called for backup, literally. <laughs> and we walked in together, you know, yelling and calling out and stepping over the needles that were in the entranceway to the, <laughs> to the door. I mean, just all kinds of things. So, you know, there's, there's some safety concerns that you need to be serious about um, because don't don't try to be big and brave and strong. Um, if it doesn't feel right, then just back out, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Pam, I cannot tell you how excited I am about your new course with appraisory learning. Um, I'm, I'm tickled to see that come down the pike and I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to be with us today. I think this is a really interesting conversation. Um, I'm going to bring Jim Morrison back in. Jim, do we by chance have an anonymous appraiser question today? Or are we off the hook? Uh, yeah, we actually do have one. And the, these anonymous appraiser questions, Pam, are just questions from our audience. And, you know, they can reach us at comments at appraisalbuzz.com. And then we give the answers from the experts. So this one is not from an appraiser, though. It says, I'm a loan officer with a contract for a single wide on land built in 98. It has been meticulously maintained with a perfect report from the home inspector. It has a brand new metal roof. But I just received... The appraisal and the appraiser noted that the remaining economic life is just 15 years. I've handled financing for many manufactured homes, many older and not as good condition. This is the first time I've had an appraiser note the 15 year life because it's manufactured housing. All right, I'm gonna let Pam answer that question, but I'm gonna address one small issue. I'm going to assure you the land was not built in 1998. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And right. tip Typically, manufactured homes, manufactured housing have a much shorter life span than st stick built homes. You're looking at, I think it's like 30 to 45 years typically. So based on the age of that, you know, you do the math and there's several different ways you can calculate that. But yes, if it's well been well maintained, it's still not going to be 30 years. Uh, it does have wear and tear in all of the uh, components that go into it. I think that's um, I think that's about as good as of an answer as we're going to get today because I don't deal with a whole lot of manufactured housing, Jim. So could and this is maybe is a little obvious for a regular appraiser, but could they still get a loan for if it, if the if the life is less than thirty years? Can they still get a thirty year loan on it? That's going to be totally dependent upon the lender's criteria. And you know, are they trying to sell it? in the secondary market or they got a portfolio it so yeah you probably can i just don't know where <laughs> well now i would suggest i mean for a loan officer that point i would suggest look if, if you're looking at an asset that has you know 15 year remaining economic life look at doing a 10-year note i mean if, if you've got a piece of property that is yes it's well maintained yes it's on some land that was built in 1998 but i'm sorry i'm gonna keep going back to that um you know, maybe look at it. It's not going to be. Um, maybe you find a buyer that doesn't need to do that over 30 years since the cost of buying the asset is not going to be as much as would buying a brand new one. So you look mm -hmm. at maybe doing a shorter term note. Okay. Right. And I am not that familiar with doing manufactured housing loans. Mm -hmm. So I will say that when I worked at the bank, we, we were not, we did not do those. So. I mean, here's just just as a side note, Jim. Um, you know, there's there's this there's this kind of countrywide preconceived notion that a house note must be thirty years. Yes, and that's simply not true. The first house I bought, we put on a thirty year note. Every house that I've owned since then, we did not put on a thirty year note. I, I don't like borrowing money for that period of time. And look, I mean, let's face it. I started appraising the early nineties. I don't have 30 years left to pay <laughs> off a note. Right. Um, so, but I mean, the point is for a loan officer, 
you're not tied to a 30 year mortgage. You can do if you're and especially if you're in a portfolio, keep it inside inside the bank. Um, you know, all bets are off. You can do a 10 year mortgage, take a little bit less of a down payment. I don't know. There, there, there are creative ways to deal with that, I would think. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say that probably the best person to ask that particular question is Kathy Putnat. Kathy is also developing a new course for AEL and it is yeah. on manufactured housing. So <laughs> she's probably the one we need to be talking to about that. Well, we That's actually interviewed it. her earlier, so we maybe we'll have to go back and, and feed her this post and add it in. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, I think that's what we do. I think we go to Kathy and bring her in and we'll do a punch in at the end of this podcast with Kathy <laughs> actually answering the question because Pam and I, neither one of us know the answer. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much, Pam. I think this is a great interview. We can't wait for your class. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Is there anything else we need to cover, Jim? No, we've covered it all. In that case, for Jim Morrison and Pam Teal, I'm Hal Humphreys, and that is your appraisal buzz for this week.